This is Off the Break Podcast, presented by Silver Screen Insider. Welcome to the Off the Break Podcast, your podcast dedicated to current movie theater news, operations, and insights from the people that book the movies. I'm Ken. Uh, Kyle's here today. Cody is out. She has a, a frog in her throat, which means... Uh, not too pleasant for the auditory experience for our <laughs> for our listeners. No, it's definitely not uh, ASMR uh, type material. So you're just gonna have to listen to our soothing listen, deep listen, voices. Listen while I run my fingers through a comb. Because <laughs> that's satisfying in yeah, some way. <laughs> something, something. Well, we might as well just jump into this week. You know, we're the week before Thanksgiving. We're not going to have a podcast next week because you're going to be too busy counting all of your money <laughs> from all of this attendance we're going to have. Oh, like yeah. Sick. I mean, five five wide releases, and then we've got stuff in the market all over the place, things coming back. We have Spencer, um, locations that haven't played French Dispatch, places that are looking for Belfast finally. So, yeah. I mean, they're locations that are opening 10 films next week in the next 10 days yeah i mean it's getting to the award season right all those oscar movies are starting to build their momentum so any theaters that might want those titles like this might be a great time just to pounce on them and have a good thanksgiving weekend because of it get it in i mean we don't have any releases until west side story so there is after the thanksgiving corridor there is a sea of nothingness which there is every year there's right. always this like a lull, lull. <laughs> which is which is fine i mean we get it i mean people are shopping more than they're looking at viewing there there's more holiday parties but then we hit the you know christmas hanukkah corridor where we really uh, bump up those releases again but there's just little lull but that's time to fit in some of these films you haven't had time to play just yet or to really capitalize on things like ghostbusters spider-man <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I All mean, these, uh, not not Spider Man. Sorry, Ghostbusters, Encanto. I mean, King Richard could could maybe be possible, but mostly it's those Thanksgiving ones like Encanto, like you said, but also House of Gucci. That really could be a title where the lull could benefit it, and it's an exclusive movie or movie theater release. So it, it's possible that you could still see good business after absolutely that busy Thanksgiving And we're weekend. seeing surprising pre sales at a lot of the theaters we work with. For House of Gucci is the one that's throwing out bigger numbers than something. So I think the numbers we're seeing of 13 to 15 million are actually going to be very low. <laughs> yeah. And we've seen them outsell. I mean, not that King Richard, we expect to do any business, but the HBO Max is going to hurt it. There's going to be people that are choosing not to go to theaters because if they're going to see that film. But if you want to see Gucci, if you want to see Lady Gaga, you have to go to the theater. <laughs> yeah. You have and, to buckle in. Go yeah. for the ride. And I totally think people will want to do that. There's a lot of love when it comes to Lady Gaga. And despite Cody's complaints about Adam Driver, there is love for Adam Driver as well. Adam Driver, you get no love. <laughs> <laughs> Not with that nose. <laughs> oh, it's all right. We'll, we'll stay serious today. We'll stay yes. very... Straight and serious, straight laced. Cody's not here, so we're gonna actually be serious today in this mm. podcast. No, no joking around. Um, do we have any um, booking changes? I saw just the one. I think was national champions from STX. Yeah, despite us being gone this last weekend and going into this new weekend, the real immediate change that we have seen was this uh, sports movie called National Champions moved from or off of the thanksgiving weekend and moved into uh december 10th and that is still when the lull isn't happening in december that is the weekend before yeah so i i kind of wish they could have slotted into december 3rd which is that lull of a weekend but i mean all it, we have, it's a smaller title anyway yeah all we have is 1210 is west side story and i think this is only going like top 500 locations oh i see so it's not it, it's not a, a limited release by any means but it's going to be a smaller release gotcha um but the content looks good. It's a football movie in December, which is what we need. Yeah. <laughs> we already have one slated with uh, American Underdog on oh, Christmas right. Day. Yeah, I mean, we'll, take, we'll take as many football movies as we can in the fall and winter. Yeah, I mean, people still love football despite... You know, many people coming up with reasons not to enjoy football, but that seems to not matter. So <laughs> people still love football. Let's have some football movies, and we're gearing up towards the playoffs anyway. Yeah, and the trailer looks great. It's got J.K. Simmons, so anything, anytime you put J.K. Simmons in a movie, I'm going to at least check it out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> at least see why Why did J.K. Simmons choose this movie. There's I, some credibility <laughs> here. <laughs> I feel like he's the opposite of like the uh, Ray, Ray Liotas that you see where Ray Liotta does yeah. anything he possibly can. 
just for the check jk simmons i feel like anytime he has like this twinge like yeah. he has is like the hand, the hair stand up on the back of his arm is like all right i guess i'm making 19 movies this year because <laughs> this one this one got my attention yeah whether they're good <laughs> or bad there's just something about his um i don't know i guess his credibility as an actor to where he's always gonna give it his all like it's not shoehorning it in by any means so no yeah. <laughs> he's, he's choosing very specifically to do this film for the some ch- reason the check is just a bonus i don't know just oh. whatever is he supposed to be in the new spider-man too oh yeah <laughs> he's gonna have two the two biggest releases of december <laughs> with this <in> spider-man <laughs> yeah i say that is a surefire <laughs> bet <laughs> oh well, but uh, since we missed the last weekend, there was kind of some stuff going on. I mean, we learned that Eternals opened up to seventy million, and Clifford even had a good weekend. Um, the following weekend after that, so let, let's dive into that. Yeah, um, Clifford matched Paw Patrol almost dollar for dollar at almost all of our locations. It wow. was very, very similar to the openings that we saw. We had more theaters open for Clifford than we did for Paw Patrol. Right. Um, print count was higher, um, but. I mean, it was it was a very solid opening for a movie that was on Paramount Plus at the same time. I yeah. wonder what would have happened if they would have just opened it in theaters. <laughs> I wonder why it's not going to be in the top 10 this year. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, weird, because <laughs> they cut themselves off at the knees when it came to this theatrical gross. Yeah, and even still, they're trying to do a big grand opening of this thing all the way back to like tuesday <laughs> they're like it's opening early on a wednesday but there's early early showings of it on tuesday <laughs> yeah no and it's it, like which one are you looking forward to more movie theaters or paramount plus yeah in the five five or six or seven day weekend whatever they want to call it <laughs> yeah was big i mean it was like 22 23 million i think yeah what i saw so i mean that's very respectable for a new entry because I don't think Clifford's had a theatrical movie yet. I think this is the first one in the, I don't in think the Clifford so. realm. Yeah, in the Clifford verse, we've had we've had Beethoven, the Beethoven verse, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of other giant dog movies. <laughs> I think that's it. I don't think Benji was big. <laughs> no, he was a little dog. He was little, <laughs> just loyal like old Yeller. He's a little okay. guy. Yeah, <laughs> he helped you get out of trouble. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah, Eternals had the. Normal Marvel drop off. We saw the drop off mm-hmm. less than sixty percent. A lot of places it was, it, it was fifty percent. So that was pretty solid for what we saw. Was it week. less than fifty? Was it? I thought. It, or wait, did you say less than fifty? Less, less than sixty. Than, oh, less 60. sixty. Okay, sorry, yeah. I misheard what you said. I was gonna be like less than fifty. Holy no. cow! But uh, yeah, it was pretty close to the sixty percent range, I believe. And I think that's actually pretty good, especially for this new era that we're in for. Uh, movie theaters so i i'm sure that there's you know diehard marvel fans out there that are really looking deep into this stuff more than they need to and they're freaking out about its um you know about its success at theaters but this is actually a pretty relatively good drop off this is about what we're seeing for most of these uh box box office or or, excuse me blockbusters yeah it looks like it did settle at 62 percent after the the week run so okay but even still that's low in the 60s which is still what we're oh yeah seeing at this point if it was a 70 percent no, drop off that's no 73 percent from a mortal Kombat, or <laughs> i mean mortal Kombat, suicide squad <sighs> warner brothers specific hitting that i mean notice a trend everyone <laughs> that was always the the joke on like the dc movies was like the drop was the, the opening was so big and the drop was so big <laughs> batman v superman yeah but now it's like specifically warner brothers like holds down they just can't catch a break anymore since they we've, curse themselves since we've gone to the theatrical only model for most of the other film companies it's the drop has been you know marginalized it's gone closer to what we're used to to that 55 to 65 yeah percent and then yeah we'll see what king king richard does this week opening and then the second week is just gonna you know i mean will smith is i mean he's famous for like jumping off of cliffs and things like <laughs> it, it, i think he did an independence day there was one in wild wild west he, he's more <laughs> <laughs> he's, a he's more known for action movies first i suppose than his uh oscar turns yeah but he has just as many outings so i'm definitely interested to check that out in the theater and see what what it looks like but sure eternals was you know the most controversial of the marvel movies we've had quote unquote so far (laughs) i mean the most yeah whether whether it was uh real or people got excited about it for for real reasons or fake reasons it is what it is it was it was controversial it wasn't 
you know, who is going to be the Hulk? It's not Mark Ruffalo. People getting excited about that. Yeah, <laughs> that was that was nothing. That wasn't a uh, a politicized issue. There weren't <laughs> there weren't people holding rallies based on <laughs> whether or not for or against Mark Ruffalo. Yeah, it, there are now, but <laughs> back then, as starring as the Hulk, it was kind of a non-issue. <laughs> right, right. Um, I guess with this quote unquote controversy, and we're going to get more into it later. Uh, down the road for this podcast episode but um it, it's just funny like it, it's a controversy and it's not at the same time like it still is making money it still seems like people like it but they're just trying to see if there's controversy like people don't like it as much as some movies which is okay which is fine that's <laughs> As that's long as how, you like it on any sort of level, it's that's fine. how movies work. Vote with your dollars. Yeah. They are going to make a second Eternals movie based yeah. on the fact of how many people went to it and paid money to go to it. <laughs> like it yeah, doesn't exactly. have anything to do with whether or not, you know, they they worried about politicizing. Disney has never as as whitewashed as they have made all of the Avengers and Disney animated universes. Mm-hmm. If if something makes money, they're gonna make it again, yeah, and again and again and again. We don't know why it worked, but <laughs> we're gonna do it again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And even still, it's possible that this controversy, whether it was organic or whether it was kind of built on for whatever sort of reasons, it also could have helped make have this money or have this movie make money. Like it's very possible that just like word of mouth and that curiosity factor could have played a role into it. Yeah. Speaking of curiosity factor in movies that are going to make money we have ghostbusters today it's releasing (laughs) i've been talking about it since what (laughs) september august or september yeah whenever i came back from vegas yeah so let me let's get your full on ghostbusters review kyle let's just throw it all out there yeah because the reviews i'm seeing are great yeah and i'm in the same camp i actually had a great time with this movie uh going into it you know, I have as much love for the first Ghostbusters movie as anyone does. Like, it, it's a classic at this point. But it's also a movie I would say is a lightning in a bottle type movie. Like, it just had the right type of people. It had the right type of um, uh, people behind the scenes and on camera to where they were just able to make magic. And sometimes that magic just is hard to replicate no matter what you try to do. And I think we've seen that with the likes of Ghostbusters 2 and the 2016 Ghostbusters movie. Like, it's just, it just doesn't always be able to have a pattern of repeatability. But here, I ended up coming away liking this movie because it doesn't try to necessarily repeat what worked in the first movie, but it just plays off of it so well for a new generation. Like, it just has a story where. It's not worrying about the spectacle of it all first. It's worrying about characters first. And it really does so in a way that also pays tribute to what was done with Ghostbusters before. And it plays into some nostalgia that, for me, worked really well as compared to some other movies that really beat you over the head with nostalgia elements. But what it came away was that clearly the director, who's the son of um, Ivan Reitman, who made the first uh, Ghostbusters movie... He was just able to understand it so well because obviously he was on set as a young kid when his dad made it. So growing up, he just understood Ghostbusters and he just knew how to play into it for, you know, a new audience, a new uh, age that we're living in. And I just really appreciate that he was focusing on the younger characters first because they're learning about Ghostbusters, kind of like how this new audience is learning about too. But it also plays into the, the nostalgia of it all where... Um, those who grew up with Ghostbusters first are really going to end up liking those beats. So it's just, it it plays a fine line very well between those two things. And it it was just very enjoyable, very funny. And it it does a good job with all the Ghostbusting stuff, which we love. The Ghostbusting stuff? You turned it into a verb. That's awesome. Yeah. (laughs) Because that's what they do. (laughs) They're Ghostbusters and they are Ghostbusting. They are (laughs) Ghostbusting. What what are the expectations for this to open up? Right now, I'm seeing that the Friday gro- or the Thursday gross was four million, um, and it seems like Sony is kind of projecting it to be twenty five to thirty million. And I initially was hoping for it to be like thirty to thirty five, maybe forty, but it's kind of like a wide window that I'm pushing at that point. But I don't know. Even though this movie is really good, and I would encourage people to see it, I'm after seeing like the Friday the Thursday numbers. 
I just wonder if maybe Sony is right on this one and it's not going to have that big opening that we kind of were hoping for. Yeah, that's scary because yeah. uh, I'm looking at the uh, 2016 Ghostbusters open to 46 million. <laughs> I mean, that's a big opening. I know it was panned, but I mean, it still went on to that do... Might've, that might have to them been a failure of an opening too. Yeah, I mean, of course, if you were going to re re-energize a franchise after 30 years yeah i mean they have probably have realistic expectations but that one made 128 million dollars if this doesn't do that I, w- I would be shocked based on the star power and the story and the reviews but you know I, stranger things have happened <laughs> yeah <laughs> pandemic i just it kind of goes into the worry that i've had for the longest time with ghostbusters it's just a franchise that doesn't need to be a it's, it's just not a franchise to me um it it you know of course it has potential there's elements there to where you certainly could make that argument but i don't know just after my many times of seeing ghostbusters and then witnessing what was 2016's ghostbusters movie that's just the conclusion that i've always came to knowing and while i did like this new movie and i think people really should go see it because it is excellent i just uh, i i think people get the same sense that i did initially and that it's like why bother yeah yeah, and maybe maybe time to move on from these. I mean, obviously they're beloved characters and beloved storyline, and yeah. it encapsulated New York in the 1980s. Yes, which is a very romantic time for New York City. Yeah, but it's you know it may be one of those things that needed all of those specific elements at that time to work. Yeah, that's exactly the, light, the lightning in a bottle element. Exactly, and some movies are just that. I understand wanting them. You know, whether it's from, you know, a storytelling element or whether it's from a studio element of, hey, this could make us money. I get why you would want to do this so badly, but sometimes it's just not going to happen, no matter how good the movie is. But I'm really hoping the box office turnout is a surprise, like we've seen with many other movies lately that have ended up being box office surprises. Eternal surprised us. Venom surprised us. Maybe Ghostbusters can do that. Yeah, I'm seeing they just crossed 500 ratings on Rotten Tomatoes with a 96 audience score. I know it's very early, but that is a big number. That's good. <laughs> That's a There's mess. no controversy there. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, that leads us into our our last last topic before we get into the trailers is what do we think about Rotten Tomatoes scores? I know we've talked about this in previous podcasts. We've gone over exactly how the ratings work. Um, but specifically, are these useful for our audiences coming in? <laughs> yes, but they drive me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it really, I kind of took a deep dive after hearing Eternals had such controversy with audiences. And I'm like, where is this coming from? Because the movie is different from most MCU movies. But when I'm, as a fan, looking at what other fans are saying online... I'm seeing mostly positive stuff. I mean, at worst, people are like, eh, it was just different and not my thing, but it was good. And so I, I took a look at where it was all coming from because all these headlines are like, there's controversy within the Rotten Tomato scores. And based on what it was for Eternals, I believe for the critics, it was a 59%, which, you know, that is pretty split. But when it came to audience scores after a week, it ended up being in the 70% range, maybe like 80% range. And that to me... You know, it just was interesting that audiences aren't feeling this controversy or feeling the same sort of um, reasons to not like this movie as compared to like critics do. And my takeaway was it was that it doesn't really matter what the critic score is for the most part. What matters is if audiences are going to like it. I mean, absolutely not. If you look at a critic score for any of these films, you're wasting that quarter of a second of. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. of, of staring that you're doing yeah just burn your eyes out for that corner of a second <laughs> just block that out of your page because it it makes literally no difference mm-hmm. i mean we we can go through these pick pick three of your favorite movies and look them up on on rotten tomatoes and you'll be shocked by the critic score on some of these i mean we're not talking like one flew over the cuckoo's nest that's my favorite movie we're talking mm-hmm. about major blockbuster films I mean, you look at... Which this. caused the most talk when it comes to controversies and Ron Tomato scores. No one's complaining about, like, Ron Tomato scores of, like, a Last Duel or a French Dispatch. Obviously not. We're talking about specifically 
the blockbuster types of it, particularly like superhero movies, because they're the biggest thing, and how sometimes their scores seem to cause controversies, when in hindsight, between critics and audiences, normally they're actually aligned pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, no, and the audience scores, Kyle compiled a list of the top 20 grossing films of all time, and um, there are only three that have a, an audience score less than 70%. Yeah. So that means on 17 of 20 films, you're getting an 80% or better film. Mm-hmm. Just based, and that's, wonder why the film did so well. <laughs> <laughs> wonder why it grossed. Wonder why people kept coming back week after week after week after week for a week a uh, Star Wars Force Awakens, Avengers Endgame, Avatar, Black Panther, Avengers Infinity War. Yeah. All, ti- Titanic. All of these movies are certified fresh and Rotten Tomatoes, and the audience scores are pretty darn aligned with most of them. Yeah. I mean, we have every, I mean, 17 out of 20, that's that's the opposite of a good batting average. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a good batting average is 3 out of 20. <laughs> yeah. And I'm... <laughs> now. Yeah. So when going through at least the top 20 all-time uh, grossing movies, I was just noticing, for the most part, between critic and audience scores, the biggest difference at most is maybe 15%. It even still, they're up to where these movies are pretty much certified fresh, and the audience scores are high as well. So then we decided to be specific and just take a look at the last five years of the top grossing movies to see if this uh, similarity is happening as well. And we're coming away with that as and we're coming away with that, that that's pretty much in line with what we saw for the top 20 grossing movies. Um, yeah. The last Kyle took five year five highest grossing films, the last five years. And there are only three that fell under the 50% threshold, which is 50% is passing in Alabama. So <laughs> <laughs> why are we not going by the Alabama logic? <laughs> but I mean, there are gross discrepancies here on a lot of these. Mm-hmm. I mean, even this year, Venom 2 has a 59% critic score and 84% audience score. Yeah. If somebody tells you 84% of this movie is good to great, you're <laughs> going to see that movie. Same yeah. thing with F9, critic score, 59%. What do, what do they walk in thinking that this 10th iteration of this franchise was going to be? I didn't feel the dramatic stakes within the family as yeah. they tried to save exactly. an asteroid from hitting the earth or whatever the plot was. I honestly don't remember. Audiences came out saying 82% of the audience came out saying that movie is worth seeing. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, their box office, uh, the box office clearly says so. I mean, Venom opened to 90 million. It made more than the last movie after a pandemic happened. That's insane. <laughs> yeah. No, my favorite one of these was Doolittle. Like it's Robert Downey Jr., after Endgame, mm-hmm. where he hits his pinnacle of movie stardom, mm-hmm. and he chose to do a movie about animals. Yeah. An- animated um, anthropomorphic animals. That's yeah. what he wanted to do. So he did this movie. Critic score of 14%. All right. 14% is reserved for the worst of the worst. Audience scores, 76%. 76% of the people coming out of that film said, that was worth seeing. I'm glad I saw that. Which is what? insane, but that's what? another topic. <laughs> but, but what were these critics going in there seeing? Like, wait, he's not playing Iron Man <laughs> in a movie called Doolittle? Yeah, I. it's wild. And and granted, Doolittle is a special case because that was before 2020's uh, pandemic. And I'm sure that movie would have fallen by the wayside to begin with. But, you know, it's those rare cases within these big blockbusters um, where there's such a big discrepancy, but yet there still seemed like there was a turnout. I mean, let's look at 2019. One of the highest grossing movies was the remake of The Lion King. 52% by the critics, but 88% from the audiences. Audiences still came away being able to shut off their brains and enjoy a remake of a classic. I know. I I remember you guys going through that epic <laughs> conversation <laughs> about the, the animals the yeah. moving mouths and, yeah oh my gosh yeah that. oh what easier things to go through at that simpler time times. simpler <laughs> times i tell you what but it but you know but for most of these blockbuster type movies there really isn't much controversy within all of these ratings as these movies typically are pegged out to be i mean the black the black panthers the avengers movies their ratings are at least between 15% apart. You know, it's just what, what it comes down to is that most of the time critics and audiences are aligned with their thoughts. 
or even if they're not, it still is a franchise movie that people are familiar with and they're going to go see, regardless of if there's controversy or not. And sometimes controversy can lead to, you know, box uh, box office bank for these blockbusters if they they have a familiar name attached to them, obviously. Yeah, and people are now more than ever less likely to take risks with their with their content dollars. Yeah. They're I mean, it's easy to spend five ninety nine on a service that rebuilds you automatically every month. But when you come to the theater, you are looking for the film that you want to see. And we're seeing that with everything that came out in October. Mm-hmm. And I think we're gonna see that going through the next ten days. I mean Resident Resident Evil has a very specific audience. But and, they'll come. <laughs> but they will be there. Yeah. I mean you're not gonna see a a three million dollar flop out of any of these films because they have specific audiences that are coming to see them. I think yeah. We're out of that we're out of that realm where one, the studios aren't going to take the risk by putting a a subpar movie on screen because they have a lot riding on every one of these releases. Mm-hmm. But two, the people are going to come because there are audience. There's a reason why the movie gets made in yeah. the first place. Yeah. So the next time, at least from a movie theater standpoint, if you're hearing online or through the bushes that, oh no, this big blockbuster title, critics are divided on it. It's making audiences worried. Is this movie not going to be good? Trust me, if it's a familiar title, if it's within a sort of brand or a sort of franchise, odds are you're at least going to have a very good weekend. And that's what is very much um, the most important when it comes to these movies nowadays. Is the opening going to be very good or the audience is going to turn out? And we see from... Eternals, yes, they showed up. And probably even the controversy helps at some points. Like sometimes if, within reason, like if it's a controversy of critical ratings, then yeah, they're going to show up. But if there's obviously, you know, a more uh, controversy outside of that when it's like real world related stuff, that might be a different story. But at least when it comes to stuff like critical ratings and Rotten Tomato numbers, most of the time, it's going to cause some word of mouth that could get a curiosity factor, which could help. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, our curiosity got satiated this week when uh, a, a million trailers got released. It, it certainly <laughs> felt like it. Over the last seven days. But hey, I get it. We want to get kickstarted the Thanksgiving weekend. We want to get out of the offices. I totally understand wanting to drop all of this stuff. I'm counting a total of two, four, six, probably ten trailers that are worthy of talking about. I don't think we're... In the last year and a half, we went two months without 10 trailers being released. So this was pretty pretty epic. And we won't drag you through all of them because you can easily log into your Silver Screen Insider account and check all these out. Yeah. They're all laid out right on your trailer trailer, uh, window. Yep, they're on the trailer section of the homepage. Once you log in, you'll be able to check all of them out here. But I think we're just going to talk about the big ones or the very, very big ones. Um probably being what spider-man into the spider-verse or no way uh, what is this movie called spider-man no way home how many are there <laughs> this this is the ninth specifically or no eighth specifically spider-man movie yeah there's only two andrew garfield ones and three tobies yeah so this and now three toms so this is number eight yeah well now we're going to have to add an additional Toby one, an additional Andrew Garfield one to these count all together. They'll each get a third. It's possible. <laughs> the rumor is that Andrew Garfield and Toby Maguire are going to make an appearance in this movie when it comes to uh, it tackling multiverse stuff, as we saw from previously in Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. And while this new trailer for No Way Home didn't show that with uh, those two Spider-Man coming into the movie... I think with all the villains that appeared from the past few movies, it, it's a sure bet that we're going to see them pop up, <laughs> at least until the end so. of this movie. Andrew, and also, Andrew Garfield probably needs a check for making all these weird movies in the last year and a half. It is it is bad timing <laughs> that he's like kind of gaining momentum as an actor again, and then <laughs> Spider-Man comes back into his life. Are yeah. you going to be in Spider-Man? I, I could be winning Oscars. I've been... I've been I've done nine serious films this year. Yeah. yeah, that's great, but is what are you coming back as Spider-Man? I played Jim Baker. Yeah, that's great, but are you playing Peter Parker? <laughs> Which one? I feel bad for him. I really do. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, the trailer was cool. The trailer was really cool. It highlights the spectacle that I think audiences are really interested in as compared to 
you know what the story is about but <laughs> it, it seems like it's all about um spider-verse stuff as was the anime movie from a few years ago and i think it's really gonna get audiences interested in this movie yeah and i've heard um big um excitement for two of the odd ones on this the first one was dog with channing tatum yeah like if there's a very specific audience for this film and they are in yeah <laughs> i mean people looking at february but this trailer is going to start playing this week in theaters oh people sure are, people yeah. are not going to wait theater owners are not going to wait to put this on screen because this is going to be for for small towns this is going to be a big movie <laughs> yeah <laughs> no i think you're absolutely right the small towns are going to be the demographic for uh dog which is Jane Tatum is a, a veteran, I believe, and he's a veteran, he, and the dog is too, and yeah, and they're on a road trip because um, one of his buddies passed away, and I think the buddies uh, it, that dog used to be his buddies, and then he has to take care of it or something along those lines. But it has the makings of you know a feel good story, and it has military tie ins to where some small towns in America would really gather to watch this thing. And the other one, Doubt and Abbey too. I, <laughs> I, I don't begin to understand any of this no how the first one made one dollar i do not understand it's not for me yeah but this one according to the people that are excited this is maximum abbey this is down <laughs> abbey 2 reloaded this is their no way home <laughs> this is exactly what they wanted i mean this thing could be 17 hours long and they'll be like uh yeah sure we'll yeah. just stay here in the theater <laughs> yeah the fans are passionate even though the series is over i believe the series is over and um it probably is still going. I mean, it they're could. Probably, they probably film it in real time. They could just crank out these movies and they'll just keep showing up. But that's good to have, though. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it just depends on... And, and the trailer does look good. I mean, it reminds me of what they showed in the first trailer. And I had no idea what was going on with that. Again, kind of like with Ken. Not my thing. It's fine. Uh, but there is a diehard audience that will show up for this, as we've seen from the last movie doing so well. Yeah, no, I could tell these these two are going to be big or interesting titles because my grandma called me. She has no idea <laughs> what, what we do. We we yeah. podcast. We work with movie theaters. Yeah. But anytime she sees a trailer on like whenever there's a, a Big Twelve football game, she calls and she's like, "Are you are you going to play this movie?" <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, we will play this movie. Why didn't you tell me there was a second one? <laughs> Same thing with the the dog. I don't even know where it where it came up or where it played, but she mm -hmm. called me at seven thirty on a <laughs> Saturday <laughs> night to check in to make sure it was it was a real a real movie is what she calls them now. Right. <laughs> I don't have to sign up for the stupid peacock, do I? Yeah. <laughs> Get duped out of five dollars. <laughs> no, it is a real movie. We promise. <laughs> right now it is. All right. Well, I think that wraps up our our week before Turkey Day. Yeah, uh, gobble, gobble. I'm so sorry. But uh, <laughs> we do hope everyone has a happy Thanksgiving. We're hoping for great business not only this weekend, but that big next weekend as well. Big turkeys, monster grosses. All right. Well, Kyle, send us out. Send yeah. everybody home for the holidays. Gobble, gobble. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone, for uh, listening to this episode of the Off the Break podcast. You can find us... Um, on all podcast platforms and over at silverscreeninsider.com where if you're an exhibitor needing update and accurate information for all the movies about to come out and marketing assets to help promote these movies on your social media platforms, you can check out our website and get all that information and all of those assets that you would ever need. All right. Have a big weekend and a half, everybody. Gobble, gobble. Gobble. <laughs>